my preoccupation with orgasm may already have been evident as an 11-year-old. Though I barely knew what orgasm meant, I remember my history teacher chuckling heartily to the class as he told us that someone had missed out a few letters in the end of your exam whilst writing about saltwater organisms found in Mesopotamia. <laughs> Embarrassment spread through my body as a creeping suspicion told me it was me. <laughs> I discovered ejaculation a year or so later, and like most pubescent boys, immediately believed I'd learned all there was to know about orgasm. We're taught that orgasm is about procreation, nature's way of persuading us to continue the species. Nature wants us to spread our DNA far and wide, to achieve this, our dopamine reward system leads us to ideas like the Coolidge effect. US President Calvin Coolidge and his party were touring a farm when the first lady spotted a rooster giving a hen a good seeing to. Does he do that often, she asked their guide. All day long. Tell that to Mr Coolidge, she said pointedly. Her husband questioned, same hen every time? Oh no, all different. <laughs> Tell that to Mrs. Coolidge. <laughs> Procreative orgasms occur through stimulation of the pudendal nerve. The dopamine mechanism associated with such orgasms clearly has its drawbacks. Marnie Robinson talks of Cupid's poisoned arrow and suggests we're intended to pair bond with each partner only long enough to conceive and raise a child through the early years. In service of genetic diversity, the attraction eventually wears off as our dopamine system becomes desensitized to a specific stimulus, our partner. The dopamine cycle that follows pudendal orgasms exhibits a huge spike then a long trough of dopamine deficit, leaving us craving more and potentially struggling for motivation for other things. If we chase novelty in order to get our next hit, we end up lacking depth of connection, which I believe is ultimately what we truly desire. So it appears that these orgasms are intended to keep us, in the long term, neither truly satisfied or connected. But the last thing I want to do is disparage them. It's vital to honour and celebrate our animalistic drive to fuck. Yet my curiosity led me to discover that there's so much more, as Roger said, to orgasm than this. The intensity and range of orgasmic pleasure is essentially limitless. Crucially, other orgasmic experiences tend not to activate the dopamine system in the same way, meaning they're able to satiate for longer and they don't drain our energy or distance us from our partner. No more rolling over and going to sleep after sex. Most orgasms have an expansive quality to them as opposed to the contractive spasming that happens with the pudendal peak orgasms. Most obviously, there are full body orgasms. That's why I became interested in Tantra in the first place. But it's also possible to learn to experience orgasm locally in any part of the body. People who've had serious accidents, leaving with no feeling below their neck, are able to experience orgasm in their ear or nose, for example. And genitally, it's not just about the pudendal nerve. We're capable of orgasming through the other nerves that enervate the genital and cervical area, the pyloric, hypogastric, and vagus that women may experience cervical and womb orgasms lasting up to 20 minutes in a deep state of bliss certainly has the wow factor. Less intense orgasmic states can last for hours. We can experience orgasm purely through breathing, laughgasms and crygasms from expressing emotions in their fullness. And we can orgasm through nature, breathing in connection to a tree, say, or any of the myriad other possibilities within the realm of eco-sex. 
a realm where we all had much better access to our orgasmic potential would be a very different world. Our needs would be met at a deeper level, meaning we're not part of the cycle of always wanting more. A faster car, a bigger house, a different partner. These are all ways to avoid the sense of lack most of us experience at some level. Who needs that when real pleasure and connection is only a few breaths or a walk in nature away? We'd all be much freer to choose how to live, what we want to do to make a difference in the world, from a place of heart opening rather than craving. As each person does the psychological, emotional and physical work to uncover more of their orgasmic birthright, there's a ripple effect from sharing about their experience with others. Just knowing what's possible can change our perspective on life. It can certainly provoke our curiosity. In time, a more embodied, heart-centered, orgasmic world will become the new normal. I believe that the fastest way for this to change systemically is for us to look at the most profound aspect of our orgasmic education, our birth. Now, I assume that most of us take for granted that giving birth is one of the most painful experiences a woman can have. A painful birth is exponentially more traumatic for the baby because babies fill with exquisite sensitivity. Stan Groff, for example, developed a psychology called birth perinatal matrices, which considers the traumatic stages of birth and the dramatic influence this has on us for the rest of our life. The effects of very high levels of stress-related cortisol on the neuronal pathways of a newly formed brain can be devastating. These birth experiences root deep in our psyche and body, creating a resistance to feel more fully because we've learned to expect only pain. Later in life, this can bring us up against the pleasure ceiling. In other words, we've learned to place limits on our pleasure because feeling more pleasure also means letting in more of our unresolved pain. But this isn't actually what nature intended for us. It simply isn't true that a traumatic birth is the inevitable price we pay for evolving larger heads and brains. In some indigenous cultures, it is normal that labor is often an ecstatic orgasmic experience. A small but growing percentage of mothers in our culture also experience orgasmic birth. Imagine if, rather than receiving pain and stress chemicals via the umbilical cord as you were being born, instead you were being primed with the neurotransmitters for pleasure. And rather than being catapulted into a struggle to survive with a necessity to breathe when the cord is prematurely cut, you remained umbilically connected to your mother and were allowed to breathe for the first time at your own leisure. You would then get to participate, as nature clearly intended, in the massive release of the bonding hormone oxytocin that mothers receive following delivery. As your mother held you in her arms for the first time, both of you would feel a deep, transcendent connection with the other. Such formative experiences would set us up for a life where we want to feel connect deeply and trust because our system has learnt how good it feels instead of learning to shut out pain and to feel less. Many things get in the way of giving birth orgasmically. Our cultural conditioning to expect pain creates stress and nothing kills pleasure like cortisol. In this respect, the systemic repetition of non-orgasmic birth is largely a self-fulfilling prophecy. However, there are women who've experienced orgasmic birth the second time, but not the first. Merely having knowledge opens up our possibilities. To feel orgasmic during birth, women need to feel safe. Safe to feel more and to let go of the mind's imperative to control. Safe to trust themselves that their body really does know how to give birth best. Expert intervention and micromanaging of the birth process, on the other hand, is the antithesis of self-trust. Above all, when the experts, so-called, 
are themselves not fully in their bodies. For more on orgasmic birth, I recommend reading The Functions of the Orgasms by French obstetrician Michel Oden. To facilitate orgasmic birth, as well as their own capacity for pleasure, women can work on releasing pain, numbness, tension and tissue adhesions from their birth canal and cervix. I'm told that a happy cervix is incredibly juicy and really wants to feel. But as in other parts of the body, accumulated bioelectrical charge representing repressed emotions usually causes cervical touch to be extremely painful until this is released. Chief amongst this repressed emotion is our historical shame around sexuality. Pudendal, meaning genitals, was also the Latin word for shame. The 11-year-old me could certainly never have imagined talking openly about sex in front of a large audience. I would have been mortified. <laughs> and there's a particular taboo in our society around seeing mothers as sexual beings, which, when you think about it, is utterly mind-boggling. In conclusion, our conflation of orgasm with intercourse is actually an anomaly. So much more is possible as we truly learn to feel more of our bodies and ourselves. I believe that orgasm in its fullest sense is about feeling, connecting and bonding to a partner, to ourselves or even to something bigger. In the final analysis, orgasm is about living a beautiful life. Thank you.